Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our dear Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Our text is that portion of Psalm 37 that we've already uh, read. I'd like you to start today with that very first word uh, that's in our psalm verse. It said, hope in the Lord. Hope. So our focus today is going to be on this concept of hope. And in the original Hebrew, the word for hope is a word that's tied to waiting. Okay? Because when do you need hope? You need hope when you're waiting. And, and generally when you're waiting, if you have hope, it's because you're hoping for something good to happen. Um, so I asked the kids, you know, when have you waited for something good to happen? One of them said, well, you wait for dessert, right? Because <laughs> mom and dad say you got to eat all your food before you can have a treat or dessert. Um, or uh, last night, one of the kids said, um, where else do you wait? You wait at Disney World. I said... Yep, I get that. You see signs like this when you go to Disney World. We went there with our kids and our grandkids, and yeah, you wait. And and then the question is, why do you wait? Well, you wait because you know something good's going to happen, either a a show or a, a ride, something that you're going to enjoy. And you're willing to wait as long as you have that hope. If you don't have hope anymore, you don't wanna wait. There's lots of times in our lives when we live with this kind of expectant hope just in our everyday lives. We do it when we're waiting for a show or waiting for a ride. We do it when we're waiting for a baby, right? (laughs) A lot of preparations, a lot of anticipation for the day when uh, Davis and Carter were going to be born into this world and be held by their mom and dad for the first time when mom quit being selfish and let other people hold them, right? But you wait with great expectation, don't you? And you do all kinds of things to prepare for that day. You're waiting with hope. Um, There's other times you wait with hope. Sometimes it's um, when something bad has happened to you, you might be waiting for a surgery. Uh, And so you've got a problem. Your doctor's diagnosed what the problem is, referred you to a surgeon who can do a surgery that's going to fix it. And, And what do they do? They encourage you to wait for that day when the operating room and and a doctor are available. And and unless you're in an emergency condition in which they're gonna find a way to get you in sooner rather than later, right? But otherwise you wait with hope for that time when that surgery is gonna correct the problem and make it better again. And uh, right now, because we're in that season where couples are getting married, we've got a couple that we're praying for today, Um, And people are getting ready for the big push in spring, summer, and uh, early fall. Uh, There's a lot of couples who are engaged. And what is an engagement? It's a promise. It's a promise. And you're hoping for something that's going to happen in the future. And you look forward to that and do things to prepare for that. Uh, But you and I also know that sometimes our hopes get disappointed in this world. Um, I told the kids when we went to Disney, we were going to the Beauty and the Beast show. And that's a show, you know, and you get to participate. And we got into the waiting room, and and we got through the waiting room, and we got into the room where the show was supposed to happen. They handed out all the different parts, who was going to do what, and all that kind of thing. And then somebody came in and said, I'm sorry, folks, but you're going to have to come back another time because the show can't go on. Never explained why. And we did go back, and it was a wonderful show. But our hopes that time in waiting were much disappointed. And, and we experience that in other places of our lives. I found this guy, right? He's still waiting for the perfect job. <clears throat> right? Because sometimes people's hopes are disappointed. I mean, I've talked to folks who have walked through a job change and, and so they were offered a new position and a new company or something like that and, uh, or a new place of work. And, 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 and they really struggle with whether to take it because is this going to be a good thing or is this one of those cases where the grass is just a little bit greener on the other side and when I get there I'm going to be disappointed? It's hard, right, sometimes when you, when you wait because sometimes hopes are disappointed. So what does it mean that we live by faith and that that faith gives us hope? Well, I'd suggest a couple things from our text today. First of all, it's hope for a positive future. But it's, it's a hope that's grounded in a reality that grows from a powerful faith, a faith in a powerful God who has loved us in Jesus Christ. Sometimes our hopes 
are not met. Our hopes are disappointed. And um, back in 2015, there was a, a, a study from two Princeton economics uh, professors, along with their sociology department, that revealed something. They said that at, as a result of the 2008 kind of economic collapse and a lot of the downturn in the economy, it's, they, they, they revealed that the, uh, that the white middle-aged American mortality rate was rising by half a percent annually. And in the time they measured it, that meant there were 500,000, a half a million more deaths in that time period. Uh, and that's the equivalent of um, about 40 times the number of people who died in the Ebola con uh, um, uh, epidemic in West Africa. And, and they, they concluded in their, in their report, what's killing these Americans is even more disturbing because many of them are dying by suicide and alcohol and drug poisonings. For as the manufacturing uh, and construction jobs evaporated, wages stagnated, and blue-collar workers uh, started to turn to alcohol and opi opioids to numb their misery. To put it bluntly, he said, middle-aged Americans are dying of despair. What's despair? It's a lack of hope. These uh, folks expected to lead better lives than their parents, and and um, as a New York Times article noted in commenting on the study, they said, we're looking at people who were raised to believe in the American dream and they're coping badly with its failure to come true in their lives. Sometimes uh, we go through times in, in our world, in our own individual lives, where hope has been disappointing. And if we ground our hope in the things of this world, we know that on occasion our hopes are going to be roundly disappointed. And, and that's because we're always hoping for a positive future. Um, and our world often sells us things to help us uh, believe there could be a positive future for us. So one of those things are these things called lottery tickets. Um, I always loved Pastor Potratz because he would ask me, you know, when he saw me, he'd say, Dan, did you buy your lottery ticket today? i say, no, I didn't buy a lottery ticket. He said, well, I bought one. I said, well, why do you buy lottery tickets? He said, where else can you buy hope for two bucks? <laughs> right? Where else can you buy hope for two bucks? And uh, uh, Ken had a point, right? The reality is, though, that though it's hope, it's not much hope because you know the statistics are that uh, your odds of winning are 1 in 175 million. In fact, your odds of dying on the way to buy the lottery ticket <laughs> are greater than actually winning the lottery. And if you go to Mega Millions, it's 1 in 258 million. That, that. And the reality is, is that, that so often this world leaves us hopeless. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale, when he was walking through the twisted streets of Kowloon in Hong Kong one time, said he came upon a, 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 a tattoo studi studio, and in the window were displayed all the samples of the tattoos that you could get uh, done to your body. And on the chest or arms, you could have a tattoo of an anchor or flag or mermaid or whatever. But he said what struck me with great force was um, three words that were attached to a picture in the window uh, it was these three words, born to lose. Appropriate that Wile E. Coyote is <laughs> the fellow associated with it, because if you watch the cartoons, what does he do? He always loses to the roadrunner. Born to lose. Well, he went into the sh shop and, and he pointed at those words and he asked the, the Chinese tattoo artist, does anyone really put those terrible words on their, on their body? And the fellow replied, yes, sometimes. But he said, I just can't believe that anyone in his right mind would, would do that. And the Chinese uh, tattoo artist in uh, very broken English first tapped his forehead. And then he said, before tattoos on the body, it's in the mind. Before tattoos on the body, it's in the mind. If you really feel like you're a born loser, you just might put something like that out for display. But what a sad state 
our world is in when people feel like born losers because God invites us to a different hope in our lives, a hope that's grounded in a positive future that's guaranteed by the life that he has won for us. And this is the way he puts it. Let's read it again. Hope in the Lord and keep his way. Consider the blameless and observe the upright. This is what we hope for, is an exalted future that's grounded not on what we have done, but on what God promises and demonstrates that he does for us. Now, the psalmist in his day and age would look back, and he'd look back to see, well, we've got a God who created us. We've got a God who took care of uh, um, uh, giving Adam and Eve a solution when sin and death entered this world and the promise of his son. We've seen that God be faithful with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We've seen the same God to go to Moses and get those people out of the land of slavery. We've seen him bring to the promised land. And in spite of their unfaithfulness in the 13 cycles and judges, God has continued to be faithful to his people and give them a hope and a future, something he proclaimed again and again through the prophets of the Old Testament. Now you and I stand in a different place than the psalmist because you and I stand on the other side of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And you and I have seen a greater basis for the hope that we have in our Lord, the fulfillment of his promises that he indeed considers the blameless and observes the upright especially his son who lived that life for you and for me, who lived an innocent life and died an innocent death in our place. And the future that awaited him was the future that God had promised. And you and I are going to walk through that in just uh, another couple of weeks as on a Friday we remember his death and then wait for three days for that, uh, that celebration of the resurrection from the dead. And what we know is that God has demonstrated in Christ Jesus that you and I have that future awaiting us. And it's a future that, that will be even better than our present. And Tim Keller in one of his uh, uh, books on suffering talks about it in this way. He says, you know, in, in, in the language of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that suffering is going to, or death is going to be swallowed up. Death and suffering are going to be swallowed up in the victory of Jesus. And he said, as I thought about that, an imperfect illustration from my own life was this. Many years ago, he said, I had a horrible nightmare. Not sure if it was something I watched or if it was something I read or something I ate. For whatever reason, I had this awful dream. It was horrific. And it was horrific um, because I dreamt that my entire family was slaughtered. My entire family was slaughtered in my dream. They were all dead in, in a very gruesome way. He said, I don't, always, I don't share the details because it's really an awful dream. Now he says, I really love my family and when I went to sleep that night before the nightmare, they were all around me. But when I woke, I woke in a panic until I could feel my wife and hear her breathing next to me until I could get up and see my children. Because you see, the nightmare was so real that I thought I had lost them all. But when I woke, I got them all back again. And I couldn't even look at them in the morning without tears coming to my eyes for the joy of having them alive and there. Well, what had happened, he said, Having gotten them back, you see, after losing them, made the experience of having them so much infinitely greater. It's almost like the experience of, of losing them had been swallowed up by the experience of having them. And now they were infinitely more precious. And that's the dim hint of what the resurrection of Christ means to us. If the resurrection happened, and it did, that means our resurrections are going to happen. And that means that everything sad and horrible is going to be brought uh, up into our future glory and resurrection and being swallowed up in it in an infinitely better way than any of those experiences have been. That's the final and ultimate defeat of suffering and death. 
and it's rooted in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In those words, we're going to hear just a couple of weeks from now, he is not here, he is risen just as he said. And, and because that hope for a powerful future is rooted to a hope from a powerful faith in the power of our risen Lord Jesus, the psalmist can say this. Let's read it. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked. The one who took refuge in the Lord first and foremost was our Lord Jesus Christ. In Holy Week, we generally turn to a couple of Old Testament passages. Psalm 22 is that passage where uh, Jesus is prefigured on the cross. That psalm begins with the words that he spoke from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But that psalm also has a great deal of hope, and it says in that psalm, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And we know when Jesus died, he died in a prayer of faith. He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And we know the answer, celebrated in another great passage we often use on on Good Friday, the passage of the suffering servant from Isaiah 53, where the answer to that prayer is already proclaimed, prophesied, and predicted from Isaiah 53, 11, that after the suffering of his, that is my suffering servant's soul, he will see the light of life, he will be alive again and be satisfied and by his knowledge and my righteous servant he'll justify many and he'll bear their iniquities and the power of our faith is in this that uh, that because jesus paid for our sins our future is never in doubt and 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 the love of our god for us is never in doubt That's why Paul could say in the second lesson we read at the very beginning, now for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. Why? Not because our salvation depends on us and what we do. That's the way other philosophies and religions think. But our salvation depends solely on what Christ has done for us. It's 100% him. And that's why it's 100% sure. Because he paid the full price for our sins. And he died and rose again to demonstrate that that payment was received in full. And now we can say with the scriptures, if God loves us that much, isn't he going to take care of our other needs as well? that's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If God has taken care of our greatest future needs, isn't he going to look at, you know, needs like our health and our food and our shelter and all those things as well? Can't we be confident that we have a God who has loved us that much and who walks with us as our Emmanuel each and every day of the year? This is what it means to live by faith. Because we've got this certain hope for a positive future, we've got this hope that's grounded in the powerful faith and a powerful Savior. Let's rise and and pray about that today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus and for having, through faith in him, brought um, a certain hope into our hearts. And, And it's a hope that we know will not disappoint. We aren't waiting for nothing. We're waiting for everything, for death to be swallowed up in victory. We're we're waiting for uh, that eternal joy. But in the meantime, Lord, give us hope as we face challenges in this life, knowing that you love us in Christ Jesus, that you have loved us in the best and most expensive way, and you'll take care of those little needs as well. Help us to live in that hope as we live by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. May now that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Jesus, the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Having confessed uh, the creed and baptism, we continue with God's word for stewards today from Psalm 25, another encouragement to live in hope. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Please be seated as we gather our tithes and offerings to support ministry that brings hope into hearts uh, here and around the world and as we listen to the offering anthem. <laughs> 